Welcome to Saturday Night at the Movies, the podcast that celebrates classic, cult, and current films and the people that made them and many other aspects of pop culture. I'm your host, Steve Rubin. Our producer is Ben Shrewsbury, and our signature theme was composed by Greg Lerhoff. Here it's always Saturday night, and our mission is to chronicle film and pop cultural history one memory at a time. Tonight, we are going to spend some time in the Old West, long before Kevin Costner and Taylor Sheridan were born. We're going to talk B-Westerns with Gino Sunset Cuddy, a film historian, writer, critic, blogger, television star, and producer who hosts Sunset Cuddy's Six Gun Theater, a series that explores the history of the B-Western and who has also helped preserve over 100 classic feature films and short subjects. Welcome to Saturday Night at the Movies, Gino. Thank you very much, Mr. Rubin. Great to be here. So I, I've got to tell you that you have delved deeply in, and by the way, for the viewers who are viewing, this is a F Frederick Remington classic painting as my backdrop today for a bit. And for the audio people, just start to smell the sage and the cattle. There you go. Um, this you've done, you've done a deep dive in an area I know very little about. So I'm hoping to get a little bit of an education uh, on the B Western. I remember when I started watching TV back in the 50s, television was completely consumed by Westerns. I mean, everything from Have Gun, Will Travel to Gunsmoke and Sugarfoot and Bronco and Rawhide and Wagon Train. But that, that was, th those were TV shows from the 50s, but you've gone a, a lot deeper back into the silent era. Tell me how this all began. Uh, did you, uh, were you really into cowboys and Indians when you were little? I mean, you're a Connecticut boy, I believe. So, yes. So where where is your connection to the Old West? Well, my fascination with uh, the B-Westerns started in, I believe, around 2018, 2019. Um, because I had been well versed in classic comedies, you know, the, the old comedy teams. And honestly, I, I mean, as much as I love old comedies and the comedy teams and everything, I found myself wanting to drift off into another land, so to speak. Um, and I must give a good tip of the hat to a couple of people, one of which is my friend Larry Pettit, who runs uh, a blog called the northeast ohio video hunter and i would and i would read his blog for like videotape reviews and things like that um and then i was finding that he was really interested in b westerns and through reading his reviews on say the john wayne films that he made for lone star aka monogram pictures or a ken maynard film or a wally wales uh it really grew my uh interest and so I just posted on Facebook, uh, recommend me some B-Westerns so I could dip my toes into the genre. And another tip of the hat must go to my friend James L. Nybar, who is an author and uh, film critic uh, who, who has written a multitude of books on film history, uh, one of which being a book on the B-Westerns of John Wayne. And uh, he pointed me in the direction of the Buster Crab and Al St. John uh, series that was made at Producers Releasing Corporation, otherwise known as PRC. And so I began watching those and I was fascinated with them and I found myself enjoying them. I mean, even though these films only clocked in in about, say, about 58 minutes, I found myself enthralled by them. And then I started discovering, you know, other cowboy stars like Ken Maynard, Hoot Gibson, Buck Jones, and the list goes on and on. And sooner or later, I uh, wound up dipping my toes into silent westerns. I mean, to give a bit more of a background, uh, I had, uh, when my father passed away in 2002, I was only six years old at the time. And my mom had given me a book called Why a Duck, which was verbal and visual gems from the Marx Brothers movies that was compiled by Mr. Richard J. Ennoble. And that pretty much started my uh, fascination with classic films in general. And I started going to libraries, renting uh, videotapes out of the library of old movies. And 
sooner or later, I found myself, you know, mingling with some of the people who were responsible for uh, preserving a lot of this material and who were also historians and really interested in this material. And so that's how I made my connections with people like James and people like Larry and so on. And uh, so that's pretty much how I got interested in uh, the B Westerns. You know, it's interesting when you talk about uh, watching classic movies, old movies, uh, vintage movies, getting young people today to be interested in our past always seems to be a huge challenge. I know that even in history class in elementary school, middle school, high school, history teachers sometimes um, are not the best to be teaching the subject because it needs somebody who makes it exciting for you, as history should be. And then with film history, sometimes I'll put up a black and white movie in my house and the kids will watch, my kids, my kids are no longer kids. They're 26 and 29. But I remember when they were kids, if I had a black and white movie on, they'd say, oh, that's just old stuff. I'm not interested in that. Even my wife gives me grief sometimes if I'm watching an old black and white movie. But that's part of our history. And it seems to me that if you're going to look into the history of Hollywood, I think Hollywood kind of began with Westerns. Right, right. I mean, you know, let's just uh, uh, discuss like one of the earliest pioneering efforts, which was, uh, I believe, uh, Edwin S. Porter's, I believe it was 1903, The Great Train Robbery, which he made for uh, Edison, you know, with that famous shot of the bandit looking straight in the camera and shooting the gun. You know, and uh, all the great uh, filmmaking techniques uh, therein. I mean, you know, you you are correct. I mean, a lot of you know, Hollywood has westerns to thank for, you know, really igniting you know, film history. Um, I mean, Cecil B. DeMille and John Ford came out to California in the in the teens to make Squaw Man. And I'm sure that they came out here specifically because of the sunshine and the fact that uh, there was a lot of greenery around or prairie and desert, most of which is now being occupied by apartment buildings and condominiums. But uh, mm. yeah, no, I, I think that uh, what uh, I had an opportunity to work. I started my career as a film publicist. So I worked on a lot of shows on location. And one of the first shows I worked on it was called Endangered Species. It was kind of a tech thriller shot in Wyoming. But I got to be friendly with the Wrangler because there were some cattle and horses in the movie and they needed to be handed, handled. And we started talking about the old movie lots, how back in the day there was a heavy emphasis on horse riding and horse horseback riding and the fact that actors, in addition to their training and you know, stage techniques and sword fighting and all the things that actors do, they were required to be, you know, pretty good on a horse. And uh, the equipment that the studios had at that time, if they wanted to outfit a wagon train, they had a Western prop department. And uh, I think that a lot of that, uh, when the studios started to break up in the late 50s and they started to lose their contract players, a lot of that equipment was sold off to private people who would do it. And I actually, one of my good friends is Peter Shereko on the West Coast. And if you're you're making a Western on the West Coast these days or a commercial or an industrial or whatever, you go to Peter Shereko because he's got all the equipment that you need to make Westerns. Well, one of the things I enjoyed very much is that you came up with a list of B Westerns that we should know about. And I am going to pull one up right to start because I think uh, it's the first one you mentioned, which is Hell's Hinges, William S. Hart. Uh, now, uh, I looked this movie up. Uh, it was actually added to the National Film Registry in 1994. So obviously, you're not the only one who thought a lot of Hell's Hinges. What can you tell us about this, this film? Well, Hell's Hinges is a, uh, was made in uh, 1916 by the Triangle Distributing Corporation and uh, was uh, the primary uh, baby of uh, one William S. Hart, who you see there uh, on the film poster. Uh, and uh, William S. Hart was a fascinating fellow. Uh, William S. Hart was uh, a Shakespearean actor who 
had actually appeared in the original, I believe, 1899 production of Ben-Hur. And uh, very prominent uh, Shakespearean actor, thespian. And, uh, but Hart actually held a deep fascination with the West. Uh, he actually owned a pair of notorious outlaw Billy the Kid's uh, sharpshooters. And in addition to that, he was also friends with uh, lawmen Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. So he, and, and when in his films, he strived for realism. He wanted to make them as real as possible and uh, as gritty as possible. Almost, I would even have to say, almost a forerunner to the uh, spaghetti westerns of uh, the 1960s and 1970s uh, because of just how gritty and, uh, uh, dangerous they could be at times i mean hell's hinges uh probably my favorite sequence in it is uh, towards the end uh which you know spoiler alert for anyone who wishes to see this film uh is when the uh, church is on fire and uh the uh, pastor has been shot and uh you know uh william s hart his character blaze tracy who has fallen in love with uh the pastor's sister sees her crying you know, that's all it takes for him to go back to the uh, town, which is named Hell's Hinges, and shoot it up and send it careening back to hell where he feels it belongs. Um, kind of, very kind of, biblical. Kind of, I was going to say, kind of a modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Right, right. You know, because initially Blaze Tracy is a character who, you know, is kind of a, a miscreant. He, he doesn't, you know, care for religion. He laughs at religion. You know, he's just, you know, one of the town bad boys. Uh, but then when he meets the pastor sister and, uh, you know, tends a service, his life is forever changed. And, you know, his, his devotion to God is mesmerizing. And uh, as, as a Christian, uh, you know, and as a deacon at a church, this story really endeared itself to me, you know, to see, you know, the, the change of this man who, you know, was at one time content with living a life of sin, uh, sort of migrating over to a more righteous lifestyle. Um, so, yeah, and, and and William S. Hart's films are peppered with some of that. Uh, another great film that I recommend to his is a film from 1920 called The Toll Gate. Um, and, of course, uh, there's uh, probably his last film that he made was a film called Tumbleweeds, which was uh, released, I believe, in 1924. And that one's uh, fantastic as well. And uh, if you see modern day prints of uh, Tumbleweeds, it's actually great because uh, the only time William S. Hart ever spoke on film was for an introduction to Tumbleweeds. And he discusses his career in the film industry and he discusses, you know, the Old West. It's actually quite moving and touching when you watch it. Didn't, didn't um, Bruce Willis star in a modern day feature where he plays Hart and uh, James Garner plays uh, Wyatt Earp? I think it's called Sunset. Do you know the movie? Uh, no, I uh, don't. Please enlighten me. Oh, yeah. There, it's, uh, I think it's an early 90s movie. It could be, I think, maybe even 80s. It's, I think it's called Sunset and it takes place uh, on a film, you know, film location. I guess Bruce Willis is playing Hart. And Garner plays uh, uh, wider. I, I've not seen the film, but I'm sure if you read up on it, I think you might find it interesting. Um, I, I read in IMDb, it mentioned that uh, Hell's Hinges was banned in Canada. Uh, obviously, this would be considered a pre-code movie because the code doesn't really come into play until the 30s. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it was the violence that really probably banned it in Canada? It was probably a little bit of the violence and probably uh, sort of the earlier parts of the film of them sort of scoffing almost at religion. And uh, also, uh, you know, how uh, there's uh, at one point in the movie, they take the pastor and uh, the pastor in the film is not a very good pastor. He's not very good at his job and he doesn't really believe in what he's saying. And uh, he winds up being seduced by the town floozy. And uh, she sort of seduces him and makes a public spectacle of uh, him and sort of disgraces him with the uh, church going public in the town, which is a very minor population, but uh, the fact remains. 
Uh, so I think that also might have had something to do with it. Uh, so I, yeah, anytime you you touch upon religion and especially in uh, those uh, olden days, uh, I think a lot of filmmakers would have gotten in trouble and would have gotten their works uh, banned in certain areas for how they discuss religion. And I also noticed that this movie features the debut on screen of John Gilbert, who I believe became a, a major star in silent films. Right, right. Yes. In fact, I think, um, was he one of those actors who did not make the trans transition to talkies? I think he might have been. Um, but now you've certainly put Hell's Hinges on our on our radar. Radar. If you if you want to find Hell's Hinges today, what's the best way to find it? You know. Well, the uh, the the great thing about Hell's Hinges is uh, uh, it'll soon be featured uh, on my television program, which is uh, Sunset Cuddy Six Gun Theater, and uh, the version that I will be showing has a marvelous score composed for it by a gentleman by the name of Andre Frato. Oh. And uh, he allowed me to utilize his soundtrack for the film. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about Mr. Frato, feel free to visit his website, Andre Frato, that is F-R-A-T-T-O dot com. And uh, he was very gracious in allowing us uh, the use of his score. And... Uh, so when that episode releases, uh, you could certainly find it that way. I believe there was a DVD released of it back in uh, the late 90s by, by the uh, I think it was some sort of a National Film Foundation. I think the National Film Registry may have even had some hand in releasing this. Uh, but a very great, very good print, beautiful print. Uh, color tinted, and uh, I believe there's another print, uh, another DVD released out there by the, an outfit called Alpha Video, who I'll probably be discussing at length during the course of this conversation. Uh, and there was to be a purported Blu-ray release of this film, uh, but from what everything that I could gather, that sadly never materialized. Let's move on to the next film you wanted to discuss. Let's talk about Tom Mix and Sky High. Uh, billed as a thrilling story of the Grand Canyon of Arizona. Interestingly, uh, again, uh, another National Film Registry uh, selection for 1998 and reported to be the first motion picture to feature the Grand Canyon from an aerial view. Yes, yes. And uh, Tom Mix, I believe, was a, a rodeo star. And that's going to be a common theme with a lot of the uh, stars that we uh, discuss here is that a lot of them came from uh, real cowboy backgrounds. If they didn't grow up on a ranch, uh, they grew up or were involved in uh, rodeos, and they were involved in uh, Wild West shows, which were quite popular back in the day, circuses even. And uh, Tom Mix, I believe, was uh, one of those uh, stars. And uh, Sky High is a marvelous film featuring a lot of death-defying stunts, and uh, if uh, you actually want to see a really good print of it with a beautiful score, uh, my friend Ben Medell, who is a silent film accompanist and film historian, uh, actually released a Blu-ray of it for uh, his uh, DVD and Blu-ray label, Under Crank Productions, who have also been responsible for the Mishaps of Musty Suffer, uh, the Accidentally Preserved series, uh, the films of Marcel Perez, I believe, and also uh, a Blu-ray of uh, early silent comedies with uh, Edward Everett Horton, who would later go on to be comic relief in some of the uh, Ginger Rogers sort of steer movies, and a lot of baby boomers would likely remember him uh, as being the narrator for the Fractured Fairy Tales on the old Bullwinkle show. Oh, that's um, So, yeah, Tom Mix was a great uh, cowboy, and you know, he ushered in a new type of cowboy as well. Um, whereas William S. Hart sort of uh, wanted to achieve a more of a realism in his films, Tom Mix wanted to present a more fantasized version of, of uh, the Wild West where the heroes wore white and the bad guys wore black. And uh, that tradition pretty much started with Tom Mix. And... Uh, his and uh, he inspired a lot of other rodeo cowboys to get into the business, including some that we'll discuss tonight. 
Uh, so Tom Mix and Sky High, a wonderful film uh, that I highly recommend, full of great action sequences and great uh, aerial photography of the uh, Grand Canyon, which you are right. It was probably one of, if not the first one to feature that. Very cool. I, I think the only time I ever heard the name Tom Mix was either Granny or Jed on the old Beverly Hillbillies TV series. They would always talk about how much they love Tom Mix. I think that I think she was a hero of Granny's. Uh, um, so Tom presented a little bit more of a fantasized version of a Western hero, you're saying? Yes, and that was a, a tradition that would follow throughout pretty much the entirety of the B-Western uh, heyday, which was, you know, the silent era through the 20, through the 30s, 40s, and uh, up to the 1950s when the genre started to die off. We, we should talk a little bit about where these B-Westerns originated from. Uh, often the term Poverty Row comes to mind. These are the smaller studios that were fighting for a piece of the cinema pie, usually as second features uh, in places. Uh, like, for instance, Sky High. Do you remember what company originally made Sky High? The name of it escapes me at the moment. I be I believe it might have been a tw uh, 20th Century Fox film. Oh. Or, no, not 20th Century Fox. It wasn't 20th Century Fox at the time. I believe it was the Fox Film Corporation under William Fox. Um, and uh, the reason why Ben Medell was able to release it is because uh, I believe that title was uh, public domain. And there are still some Tom Mix films that are under copyright uh or or at least were um there was one called writers of the purple sage which i'm actually very interested in seeing as well because as one of my favorite actors from that time period warner oland and it as uh, the villain and uh i believe that recently went public domain because alpha video has released it and pretty much a guarantee is is that if alpha video has released it it is in fact public domain unless you know, they didn't do their due diligence in their copyright searching. Isn't Warner Olin known as being Charlie Chan? Am I correct on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, let's move on here. Uh, of course, Poverty Row, Row is long gone. I'm sure there's some storefronts there where they used to make movies. Um, let's talk about a movie. Let's see if I can find it here. Um you came up with such an interesting list of pictures and uh i'm looking for this oh here it is right now it's because the title isn't on the picture it's jack perrin in a movie called the apache kids escape from the year 1930 directed by and written by robert horner uh this was billed as the first hundred percent talkie western produced by a poverty row studio that is, in fact, true. And uh, the recording engineer for that was none other than the notorious filmmaker Dwayne Esper, who, of course, filmed things like uh, Maniac from 1934, rather notorious horror picture there. And I believe Dwayne Esper, uh, you know, he's an exploitation filmmaker, early exploitation filmmaker. And, uh, you know, he, I believe he was responsible for distributing widely in the U.S., uh, the rather notorious anti-marijuana film Reefer Madness. Um, and he distributed similar films like Marijuana, uh, Sex Madness, uh, Narcotic, um, and a bunch of other similar titles. Um, probably the most interesting story about the Apache Kids Escape, uh, other than Dwayne Esper, is actually the, the writer, producer, and director Robert J. Horner. Um, Robert J. Horner is a guy that I've, be, you know, over the years have just grown to be fascinated with uh, because uh, Horner, you know, uh, at seven years old, uh, he and his brother were uh, playing on uh, some train tracks. And uh, Horner, unfortunately, did not uh, get to escape when uh, the, the, the train came and wound up losing both of his legs. Mm -hmm. um, so he actually wound up... Uh, uh, transporting himself through a uh, mechanized, almost sort of like a, a mechanized wheelchair, as we would call them today. And uh, so, and he had a special Lincoln that he would drive uh, so that uh, he wouldn't have to use the, the brakes. Um, and Horner was a rather interesting guy from that aspect. But an another interesting aspect is how he conducted business. Uh, I mean, if uh, you scour the internet or 
you know, use a great resource called Lantern. You know, I've read dozens upon dozens of stories of, you know, uh, Horner, uh, because he was really one of the lower level uh, producers on Poverty Row. I mean, P Poverty Row, to me, uh, ha had a sort of a hierarchy. You had your glossy Poverty Row uh, studios and you had your middle ground. Then you had your ultra low budget studios and Horner uh, was often am was among those. Another guy uh, in the same ballpark of Horner was a fellow by the name of Victor Adamson, who also went by the name of Denver Dixon. Uh, and uh, Horner, uh, he, you know, in addition to being legless, he was also kind of scrupulous uh, as well because uh, he would advertise in uh, local papers saying, oh, we're looking for actors to participate in our film, you know, just donate a certain amount of money to our film and you'll have a part instantly right there on the spot. And uh, more often than not, uh, you know, uh, Horner and this other person would sign a contract, Horner would get the money, and then he would fail to utilize uh, that actor in a particular film. So he's kind of a con man in that regard. And uh, you, you I, said, I guess... You said scrupulous. You meant unscrupulous. Unscrupulous. I apologize. Yes, unscrupulous. Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 I kind of imagine Poverty Row to be full of unscrupulous ones. When you consider the more Tony Poverty Row studios, would you consider Republic to be the upper end? Yes. Glossy, beautiful productions. I mean, that's where cowboys like Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and... Wild Bill Elliott and Sunset Carson, who's one of my favorites, uh, hung their hats. Uh, and so beautiful. And, and John Wayne also worked for them in a variety of uh, productions, including as part of uh, the Western trio, the Three Musketeers, uh, as uh, Stony Brook. Uh, but to get back to the Apache Kids Escape, yeah. I mean, star Jack Perrin was sort of a uh, second echelon cowboy actor. I mean, he was... Uh, he was... Uh, a, a cowboy hero in silent films, second echelon cowboy hero in silent films. And he did work with Horner every now and then. He also worked with uh, W. Ray Johnson's uh, Ray Art Pictures. And uh, yeah, uh, for I'm not sure if it was for the Apache Kids Escape uh, per se, but uh, Horner did wind up uh, swindling Perrin out of half of his intended earnings. And uh, Perrin wound up having to go to court in order to recoup his losses there. Uh, so Horner, while a tragic figure, was also a bit of a con man, uh, and uh, a really interesting story. Actually, he he actually worked with a rather interesting actor uh, uh, named uh, Elia Bullock, and uh, Elia Bullock uh, Horner uh, pretty much plucked out of obscurity and called him Kit Carson, and start him in some after the famous Frontiersman Kit Carson and starred him in a series of silent films. But the interesting thing about Elia Bullock was that he worked under a variety of different aliases. Uh, he worked under the name of Elia Bullock. He worked under the name of Boris Bullock. He worked under the name of Kit Carson. And most curiously, he also worked under the, the name of William Barrymore, when in fact he held no relation to the famous Barrymore acting dynasty. Um, and the interesting thing about uh, Elia Bullock uh, was that, you know, you wouldn't know it by looking at him because he's kind of a scrawny fellow. Uh, kind of made for, he was a decent cowboy hero, but, you know, not, he would have never, you know, gotten to the major B-level uh, studios. Uh, let's just say that. Uh, he, uh, the way he came to Hollywood was interesting. He was a Cossack soldier uh, in, in the uh, Russian army under the, uh, I believe it was Tsar Nicholas III. And uh, when the Bolsheviks invaded, uh, many of uh, uh, Bullock's comrades wound up uh, being shot and, and, and killed. And, uh, well, Bullock was uh, on the slate to be executed. Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, Bullock says, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. So he wound up, for his last meal, having like a can of beef or something. And what he wound up doing was taking the uh, lid from that can of beef and slitting the throat of uh, an execution of his executioner and fleeing to China 
and then to the United States, where he became a Western cowboy actor. <laughs> that's that's quite a quite a run. And you're saying that he's opposite Jack Perrin in the, in the Apache Kids Escape. No, but he was another actor that Horner had worked with. Horner oh. worked with uh, uh, Bullock. He uh, worked with Perrin. He worked with a lot of uh, the lower echelon cowboys, like uh, Buddy Roosevelt, for instance, worked with Horner. Oh. Another one that worked with Horner was Buffalo Bill Jr., alias Jay Wilsey. Uh, not to be confused with uh, the Buffalo Bill Jr. as played by Dickie Jones on television later in the 50s. Uh, so uh, there was like this whole uh, era, this whole uh, realm of Poverty Row Westerns that nobody ever talks about, this whole sector. And it's fascinating. So moving on to Ken Maynard, uh, who's in a movie called Tombstone Canyon, which you've you've chosen. Uh, it's funny because I'm looking at the poster and it says Ken Maynard Tarzan. Did Ken Maynard play Tarzan? No, 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 no. Tarzan was Ken Maynard's horse. Oh, <laughs> oh that's funny. Um, so tell, yeah. tell us why you picked Tombstone Canyon from 1932. Well, Tombstone Canyon is probably one of the best of the eight films that Ken Maynard m made for a film uh, outfit called Worldwide Pictures, also known as Sono Art Worldwide. And uh, basically, Sono Art Worldwide was another Poverty Row studio. Their logo is quite infamous, um, actually, because uh, it contains uh, actress Claudia Dell in a rather sheer nightgown or something, uh, holding two massive globes in a rather convenient area, which spin around and form the words Worldwide Pictures. Um, and uh, Tombstone Canyon is probably, again, one of Ken Maynard's best. And Ken Maynard is a rather interesting fella. He, he was another guy that they plucked from rodeos and uh, saw, thought that he would make a great cowboy hero and uh, placed him in a lot of uh, great westerns. Probably my favorite silent western of his that survives is a film that he made for the Davis distributing firm called uh, $50,000 Reward, which has a great relay sequence. And is actually filmed at a uh, dam that was just being built and has a lot of great aerial photography of this dam, uh, including a tracking shot where uh, the, there's basically a camera inside of a lift that goes all the way up the lift, all the way up to uh, the tip of the uh, dam. It's fascinating filmography I wonder, there. I wonder, cinematography. That, I wonder if that was the newly constructed Hoover Dam, perhaps. Um, it was... I don't think it was the Hoover Dam. It was another dam. The name escapes me right now. But unfortunately, that dam wound up busting at some point in the 1930s. So this is probably the only known footage of some of the only known footage of this dam, you know, being constructed and, and some semblance of operation. Uh, but Maynard was a trick rider, meaning that he could ride side saddle. He could uh, he could ride. Uh, he could perch precariously off of Tarzan and. Uh, just a wonderful writer, like he could do a million stunts on Tarzan, and uh, like he could hang like pretty much right out of the saddle, you know, holding his cowboy hat out and just think nothing of it as Tarzan is galloping at a million miles per hour. Um, and you know, his relationship with Tarzan was wonderful because he trained Tarzan so diligently, like in films like uh, Fifty Thousand Dollar Reward. Uh, there's a sequence in that film where. Uh, Ken Maynard is uh, tied to a tree, and uh, Tarzan uh, unties Ken from the tree. It's fascinating uh, to watch, you know, this rather intelligent horse, you know, responding to uh, his uh, master's every command. And the Tombstone Canyon, as I said before, is, again, one of his best that he made for Worldwide. Basically, what that film is about is uh, uh, Ken arrives to, uh, to uh, Ken arrives in town, and uh, he finds out that uh, his best friend has been shot and killed and so he's trying to find out the uh the find the culprit for the murder of his best friend all the while he has to deal with this phantom character who's lurking in the aptly named tombstone canyon which is sort of like a uh, a main thoroughfare between uh the the t uh two areas and uh the Phantom character is rather menacing in this film. He has a cape up to his face, a la like what ba uh, they had to do with Bela Lugosi's character later on and uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, but it's really effective. And the actor who plays him, the name escapes me right now, but he was excellent in the role. And uh, it and spoiler alert for anyone who uh, hasn't seen the film, and it's actually funny because Tombstone Canyon will be airing tonight 
uh, Wednesday uh, for a, a Six Gun Theater. Uh, but spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the film, uh, it turns out this Phantom Killer is Ken Maynard's long lost father. And uh, it's, it, uh, by, yeah, it's, go by, ahead. By, by the way, Gino, excuse me, um, your show airs I, in locally in Connecticut. Is that where you are, or does it have a national viewership? Um, it ha it, it's a little from column A and a little from column B because uh, uh, the program does air locally here in Connecticut. It airs for Comcast subscribers on channel 15 in uh, Middletown, Middlefield, Portland, Cromwell, and East Hampton, Connecticut. Uh, again, if you have Comcast, you could access my show via channel 15. Uh, it's currently airing at 10.30 a.m. on Saturday mornings, soon to be bumped up to its original time slot of 9 a.m., uh, with reruns airing on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. And uh, it does air nationally because uh, I have them set up on YouTube. I have upload them to YouTube where they premiere at the same exact time as they premiere on television. Uh, so they're simulcast on YouTube. So anyone who wants to watch Six Gun Theater could do so uh, nationally and internationally. And do you go, it goes by the name um, Sunset Cuddy's Six Gun Theater, correct? Correct. And you chose the nickname Sunset because of your love of Sunset Carson. Correct. Correct. Got it. Okay, let's move on to some more uh, great films. We're getting a great background, everybody. Um, we're, we're talking to Gino Cuddy about B Westerns. Um, let's move on to The Hard Ombre, which is a Hoot Gibson Western. And I know that name, kind of like the same uh, name Tom Mix, Hoot Gibson stands out to me. Tell us a little bit about why you chose The Hard Ombre. Uh, well, The Hard Ombre is a rather interesting film from a casting standpoint. It was another Poverty Row effort from uh, a producer by the name of M.H. Hoffman Jr., uh, his uh, Allied Pictures outfit, not to be confused with the later Allied Artists uh, motion picture uh, distributor. Um, uh, uh, Hoot Gibson was another rodeo star who uh, they plucked out and uh, wound up putting him in movies for Universal uh, some of which still survive a lot of great silent films, silent short subjects, silent features. He also worked with uh, Harry Carey in a film called, uh, I believe, Straight Shooting. And uh, I think he even did did some work with John Ford. Uh, the, the thing about Hoot was that he wasn't a typical cowboy hero and that he wasn't a handsome, dashing, debonair, you know, guy. He was pretty he pretty much looked like uh, your Uncle Ted. You know what I mean? And uh, he uh, rarely carried a gun. He carried a gun in his boot, I believe. And uh, his films are far more comical in nature. Who was a more comical presence? Uh, you know, and his films are rather uh, humorous in nature. And uh, the hard ombre is no different because uh, in the hard ombre, who plays a character by the name of Peaceful Patton, uh, who uh, winds up leaving a ranch uh, uh, because of uh, all the violence that has broken out. And uh, he is then hired uh, by a uh, uh, senorita, uh, uh, I believe somewhere in Mexico. And uh, the senorita is played by Lena Basquiat, who's actually pretty interesting and rather tragic character herself. Uh, she was actually married, I believe, to Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. And when uh, Jack Warner uh, passed away, uh, she, you know, had a child with him and uh, the family disinherited her from uh, the money and took her child from her, which was rather uh, disgusting, if I'm being completely honest. And uh, also, there's a rather interesting story that uh, she was one of Hitler's favorite actresses. And when he got a little too close, she gave him a heave ho, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and you certainly don't do that to Adolf Hitler. Uh, right. This is 1931, so I assume this is a sound Western. Correct. Correct. And uh, in this film, as I said before, uh, Hoop Gibson plays Peaceful Patton. And uh, he's trying to uh, get fair range rights for uh, Lena Basquette's character. And uh, no, no, and uh, the ranchers give in to his demands rather easily because of the fact that he resembles a local outlaw, a local murderous outlaw named the Hard Ombre. 
and uh, who catches on to this and is like, you know, what? I'll use this to my advantage and uh, I'll make everybody, you know, give in to my demands and uh, be fair to the senorita and uh, divide the range rights uh, equally. Unfortunately, uh, it's uh, it doesn't quite work out for him because the real hard hombre shows up and starts making trouble for him. And it's only towards the end of the film when the hard hombre starts shoving around uh, Hoot Gibson's mom that Hoot winds up, you know, being riled up with anger and he and the, the hard hombre duke it out. Uh, you know, rather, uh, one of his best talkies, in my opinion. You know, looking at this image of him from the poster, it's kind of kind of a relaxed hands in his pockets image kind of reminds me and since you mentioned he was comfortable with comedy kind of reminds me of uh will rogers a little bit yes yes i'm glad you made that connection yeah definitely so uh you know always good to put a little comedy in our your westerns which of course hollywood has always enjoyed doing let's move on now to a movie called arizona bound and I'm going to pull it up. It's funny, when I was looking for an image for Arizona Bound, I pulled up the wrong Arizona Bound. I picked up, picked up a Gary Cooper movie from the 20s, but the one you chose is from the year 1941, and it's a Buck Jones, Tim McCoy Western. Right, right. Uh, Buck Jones uh, was... Uh, uh, Arizona Bound is a uh, monogram pictures film from 1941, uh, which features Buck Jones, Tim McCoy, and Raymond Hatton uh, as uh, the Rough Riders, uh, who, by the way, have probably one of the most contagious theme songs in Western history. Uh, so uh, basically, let me discuss uh, some of the participants here. Uh, Buck Jones was a rodeo star who uh, they put into movies uh, there was uh, a movie called The Last Straw from 1920, uh, I believe, which was his first, which he made for Fox, William Fox. And uh, he was a popular Western star in silent films, uh, just as popular as Hoot Gibson and Ken Maynard and Tom Mix. Uh, but unfortunately, The Coming of Sound sort of uh, dulled his career and sent him into a bit of a decline after uh, he made a handful of films for Columbia Pictures. Um it wasn't until there was a uh, serial called White Eagle in uh, the 40s that his career was re-energized. Uh, that serial uh, was made for Columbia Pictures. And uh, it, it was around that time where uh, uh, Buck Jones uh, wanted to uh, get his old friend Tim McCoy back on screen because Tim McCoy had been out of uh, pictures for a few years uh, because Tim McCoy was also a silent screen cowboy and was actually quite uh, fascinated with Native American customs and languages and was uh, named uh, High Eagle by the Arapaho tribe on, I believe, the Wind River Reservation and uh, was very familiar with uh, and was actually uh, responsible for uh, more progressive treatment of Native Americans on film in, in the Westerns. He, he never had them portrayed as savages and was quite progressive in his treatment of them. And uh, he spent some time on the Wild West show uh, circuit. And uh, it wasn't until, uh, I believe, uh, the late 30s where his career sort of had a comeback uh, on film. And uh, it was shortly thereafter where Buck Jones said, you know, how about you come and uh, do this uh, Western trio that we're thinking of doing at uh, Monogram? Because Western trios were a big uh, sensation back in the day. Uh, you had the Rough Riders, you had the Range Busters also uh, for Monogram, which consisted of uh, Ray Crash Corrigan, John Dusty King, and Max Alibi Terhune. Uh, you had the Three Musketeers at Republic Pictures. Um, that's the John, you would look, that was the John Wayne series. Yeah, and you would also, probably one of my favorites uh, is uh, the Trailblazer series for Monogram which featured uh, Ken Maynard, Hoot Gibson, and later Bob Steele. It's funny with these trios, it kind of reminds me later on when they spoofed it, I guess, with uh, the Steve Martin, uh, Martin Short, Chevy Chase uh, movie, The Three Amigos, which probably was inspired by these trios you were talking about. Correct, correct. And the sad thing about Buck Jones was that in uh, November of 1942, after he had made the film Dawn on the Great Divide, uh, he and 491 others perished 
in a deadly nightclub fire uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and it was probably the deadliest uh, nightclub fire in history and probably the second deadliest single building fire in history uh, was the old Coconut Grove nightclub in Boston, Massachusetts, where this all happened. And uh, there was a there was a rumor that's been perpetuated, and I wish to debunk this rumor. Uh, throughout the years, there's been this rumor that Buck Jones uh, escaped, but he went back inside and saved people. Uh, that rumor was even perpetuated by uh, John Wayne uh, later on, but this was this was false. Uh, Buck Jones sadly perished with everybody else in that fire, uh, and uh, I believe he was only in his 50s or so at the time. And uh, but a great loss was dealt to the B Westerns when Buck Jones perished in that deadly uh, fire, uh, and uh, Tim McCoy. Uh, he largely retired from films. Uh, uh, he actually uh, went back to do some work for the Army in World War II, um, but he did have a television show called The Tim McCoy Show in the 50s, one of those, I believe, 15-minute joints uh, that uh, ran in the early 50s. Um, let's, let's move on to a Roy Rod Rogers Western called Roll on Texas Moon. I'm glad you included Roy Rogers in your in your mix of B Westerns, because I don't, you didn't have to be a Western fan to remember the name Roy Rogers. Right. I mean, he was, you know, uh, put it into perspective. He was one of the most, if not the most popular cowboy actors of his day. Probably. I mean, there's a reason why he was called King of the Cowboys. Uh, he, Dale Evans, George Gabby Hayes were the, the classic trio there at Republic Pictures. And Roy was, I believe, uh, the second highest merchandise actor or Hollywood personality aside from Walt Disney. Uh, and uh, you could find like Roy Rogers comic books, toy pistols, gun belts, coloring books, comic books, uh, lunch boxes. The list goes on and on. He, he established a little coup for himself with that. And uh, he and Dale were marvelous together on screen. I, you know, and, and, and I got to compare it. Uh, this may be comparing apples to oranges, but I think Dale Evans and Roy Rogers were just as iconic as a screen duo as Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I think for the B Western, certainly they were the best, they were like the Western power couple. Uh, okay. And um, uh, G just Gina, Gina, would you say that Roy popularized the idea of the singing cowboy, or was that something that Gene Autry preceded him doing, or who came first? The, actually, the the real first singing cowboy was uh, a cowboy that we had discussed earlier, Ken Maynard. Oh. Ken Maynard actually fashioned himself a bit of a singer, and I actually have a CD of some of his songs. Um, and uh, he not only lent his voice to uh, a few records, uh, but also uh, was the first singing cowboy of the movies by singing in, I believe, a 1929 film for Universe called The Wagon Master. And uh, he sang in a lot of his films, uh, a lot of his Universal films. Uh, if you want to see him sing, there's actually a great sequence in a one of his more uh, lesser-known Poverty Rose uh, films called uh, Trail in Trouble, where he plays a dual role. He actually does some singing in that. He does some singing in his um, uh, early 30s Universal films. So Ken Maynard was the first singing cowboy on screen, then followed by Gene Autry, and then Roy Rogers and Tex Ritter. And, that was another fascination that Hollywood had was with uh, the singing cowboys. And there were many. There was Jimmy Wakely. There was Eddie Dean. There was Dick Ferran. Um, Tex Ritter, as I mentioned, Jane Autry, um, Fred Scott. Who, uh, there was just so many of them. And there was also a singing cowgirl in Dorothy Page uh, who made uh, three films for Grand National Pictures uh, in the late 30s before that studio went under. You know, the, the Western is such a male-oriented uh, genre. I would think that the singing cowboy uh, was maybe a little bit of a nod to women so that when they came to see the Western with their boyfriends, that maybe they would like that. Right, right. And uh, Roy had just as many female fans as he had male fans. And, uh, and of course, you know, with the presence of Dale Evans, that... Uh, you know, she was a great singer, songwriter, uh, an author as well. She wrote a great book called uh, Angel Unaware uh, about a rather tragic event that happened in uh, both her and Roy's lives where 
they wound up losing uh, their daughter uh, at two years old due to complications associated with uh, Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Dale Evans was a big proponent and her story sort of touched me as somebody who's on the autism spectrum, who suffers from a myriad of mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, ADHD. Uh, her story really inspired me because it's like, here's a lady who, you know, basically was one of the people involved in reforming uh, the public's perception of children with mental illness and people with mental illness. And so I commend her for her work and love her dearly for what she did. And, you know, I mean, you know, and she was a trooper, you know, in, in her life. I mean, you know, you, you, you hear the common expression now of teen mom and you hear, and there's like MTV shows about it and such. Well, Dale Evans was a teen mom. She got married at 15 and had a child at 15 and her husband, you know, left her. And so she was, she had to not only take care of her child, but she also had to, you know, find work in the music industry, which she eventually did, I believe, on the uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy uh, radio program. So that, that was her first husband who left her. Yeah, yeah. Before she met Roy. Now, yeah. I'm going to put up um, sun, a sunset. You chose a Sunset Carson movie. I'm not surprised. It's called Santa Fe Saddlemates. And you seem to be a, a big fan of Sunset Carson. Tell me why. I love Sunset Carson for many reasons. Uh, the first of which is probably, uh, you know, his, he was probably the tallest B Western star, I believe at, uh, I believe he was 6'1 or 6'2. Uh, one of the tallest uh, of the B Western stars. Uh, and, uh, or or maybe even 6'11. He was really a tall fellow. Tall drink of water. The, the actual figure escapes me at the moment. Uh, but I love Sunset not only for that, I love his uh, country twang. He really was an authentic cowboy who just came to movies. And uh, he, I, I love him, too, because a lot of his films are filled with action, action, and more action. That's what Herbert Yates at Republic Pictures called for. And Santa Fe Saddlemates is probably my favorite of all the westerns that he made for Republic because within the first minute of film, Sunset gets into three separate altercations. Like even before the, before the plot gets underway, I, I and uh, and I'm going to go out on the limb here and say that Santa Fe Saddlemates is the best B Western, B Western ever made, because wow. it has tons of action, it's fast paced, it never wears out its welcome, and I also do have to admit to having a wandering eye for leading lady Linda Sterling, who was the queen of the serials, the queen of the serial cliffhangers. She played the uh, Tiger Woman, the Panther Woman, and uh, she also, uh, quite famously, uh, was uh, probably and uh, holds the distinction of being the only woman to ever star as uh, a Zorro or a Zorro like equivalent in a serial called Zorro's Black Whip. And uh, there's a rather touching interview with her in Sunset Online, which I uh, recommend people seeking out. Uh, Santa Fe Sodomites is a classic of the B-Western genre. I mean, the film moves by so quickly, you, you don't even learn the name of Linda Sterling's character. Like, you know, or, 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 or who or what her motives are. You know, I mean, it... This is, 19, I mean, it's, this is 1945, um, obviously, yes. uh, in the middle of the sound era, or the beginning, uh, fairly in the, in two decades into the sound era. Now, I looked through the cast of Santa Fe Saddlemates, and I came across an actor who is one of my favorite character actors. His name is Olin Hallen. And Olin, oh, yes. Olin Hallen plays a character named Aloysius Philpotts. And uh, the reason I know Olin Hallen so well is if you're a science fiction fan, and as you know, I'm a science fiction fan, Olin Hallen was a, um, an alcoholic in the alcoholic ward of the classic giant ant movie, Them. Oh, yes. He's the one who says, uh, when the soldiers come to meet him with the police officer, he says, uh, make me a sergeant in charge of the booze and I'll join up. And then if you follow Olin Howland's career, and that, of course, was nine years after he did Santa Fe Saddlemates, 13 years after he did Santa Fe Saddlemates, he's the old man at the beginning of the blob who gets the blob on his hand. That's Olin Howland. And oh, my God. Really? Yes. Yes, I love the Blob. That's probably that's probably my favorite of the '50s sci-fi movies. 
I saw that for the first time a few years ago on Turner Classic Movies, and I was mesmerized by it. Oh, yeah. Especially the, the famous sequence of the blob just spilling and oozing out of the movie theater while all the patrons just run away in terror. <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, of course there were remakes, and a lot of, you know, my, my more contemporary friends love the remakes. But nothing could touch that Steve McQueen, you know, original. By the way, in my opinion. By the way, billed as Stephen McQueen, which I love. And supposedly, <laughs> I heard the story that when he was dying in Mexico, going through the Laotil treatments, trying to kill his cancer, he had one image up on the wall of his hospital room, and it was the poster from The Blob. And I thought, oh, that was wow. So cool. I, I, I love how in the uh, original trailer for The Blob, or it might have even been a reissue uh, trailer, but there's a trailer out there where it says, and starring Steve McQueen and the cast of exciting young people. <laughs> and uh, I guess another fascination for me for uh, uh, The Blob is the fact that, you know, you get to see Steve McQueen lip locking with Andy Griffith's on screen girlfriend. Anita Corsuit. Kors yeah, no, exactly. Now, you, you mentioned that Santa Fe Saddlemates is action packed. It, uh, I also found out that it was co directed, uncredited by Yakima Kanat, one of the great Hollywood stunt coordinators of all time who drove the chariot in, in the 59 Ben Hur. Uh, we're running out of time, but I want to go over a couple more titles before we go because this has been so great. I mean, you are such a sage. When it comes to the subject, and ironically, the next title is the sheriff of Sage Valley with Buster Crab playing Billy the Kid. Ah, good old Buster Crab. I love him. As a matter of fact, uh, for those uh, out there uh, who are going to be watching the the video version of this, um, I sell uh, on uh, T Public a bunch of T-shirts uh, uh, for uh, Six Gun Theater uh, because. I don't make any money off of Six Gun Theater uh, because it's a public access television production. Uh, so this is my way of, you know, sort of uh, making a little bit of money from that property. Uh, but uh, one of the shirts that I sell is uh, this shirt, which I don't know if you could see here. It's uh, Buster. It's Buster Crab alongside uh, his sidekick, Fuzzy Q Jones, played by Al St. John. And... Uh, the thing about Buster Crab is I can't decide between him or Tom Tyler, who had probably the biggest impact on pulp cinema. I mean, you know, you have Buster Crab, who played Tarzan on film, who played Buck Rogers on film, who played Flash Gordon on film. And then you have Tom Tyler, who played Karis in The Mummy's Hand, who played uh, uh, Captain Marvel in a serial. And then he then he also played um, the the Phantom in a Jungle serial, so it's it's real you know, and and they were both cowboy heroes. So I can't decide you know on on the particular day I'll probably say Buster Crab, and then on the next I'll say uh, uh, Tom Tyler. But Buster Crab, fascinating guy. I mean, he was originally an Olympic swimmer and uh, a great his, Olympic swimmer. His original name Herman Bricks. No, 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 no. His original name was Larry Crab. Oh, Larry Crab. I think I'm confusing. There's there, Herman Bricks became. He was in a Humphrey a series of Humphrey Bogart movies. He's in Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I'm trying to remember who that is, but no, I'm I'm digressing. But go on about Buster. Buster was originally what was his name, uh, Mr. Crab? Uh, Larry Crab. Larry Crab. Not really a cinematic title. Right, so they called him Buster Crab, and uh, he uh, actually in the uh, Billy the Kid series for Producers Releasing Corporation, uh, which I also have a, a shirt of um, here. Uh, Producers Releasing Corporation was is probably one of my favorite of the uh, Poverty Row Studios. Here's the shirt I made in tribute to PRC uh, with uh, all of the cowboys there who start for the studio with uh, the PRC logo at the bottom. And uh, the Billy the Kid series for PRC originally started out with Bob Steele in the role of uh, Billy the Kid. Uh, but then uh, he wound up leaving to go to Republic Pictures. So uh, PRC wound up hiring Buster Crab. Uh, and the interesting thing about the Billy the Kid series is that eventually they dropped the Billy the Kid moniker because 
you know, I, 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 I'm, I've never found out conclusively, and I would probably have to read my friend Thomas Reader's book on the uh, uh, Newfield, Newfeld brothers called Poverty Row Royalty, which is available from Split Rail Publishing. Uh, I would probably have to read that book to find out the definitive reason for that, but I've heard uh, differing stories that a lot of parents' rights groups uh, were outraged that it, it appeared that PRC was glorifying a, uh, a, a crazed killer. So they wound up uh, changing his name from Billy the Kid to Billy Carson later on. Uh, and in Sheriff of Sage Valley, Buster Crab actually plays a, a dual role as not only himself, but also his uh, delinquent brother. And uh, his sidekick is uh, Al Fuzzy St. John. And uh, Al St. John was a silent film comedian uh, who goes back to the days of Max Sennett and Keystone Studios. As a matter of fact, he was a Keystone cop. He was actually, Al, uh, he was actually uh, Ros Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle's nephew and starred in uh, a lot of uh, films alongside his uncle and also Charlie Chaplin, Mabel Normand, and a host of others. Uh, so uh, Al St. John, you know, then had a second career as uh, a Western sidekick, and he also starred alongside uh, Lash LaRue, who was the star of King of the Bullwhip. Right, who, which, I, which I wanted to bring up as one of our last movies to talk about. Yes. And uh, Lash LaRue was uh, an, an interesting character uh, and I've assured of him here too, because uh, he was the literal king of the bullwhip. Uh, he could ma he mastered a bullwhip and, and was great at it. And unlike a lot of the other cowboy heroes at the time, he dressed in all black, which usually was a color uh, worn by villains. And uh, funny story about him: you mentioned Humphrey Bogart earlier. Uh, he actually did a, I believe, a test for Warner Brothers. Uh, but they wound up passing on him because he held too much of a uh, resemblance to Bogart. Um, and so uh, they he wound up uh, starring in uh, some Westerns for PRC, starting out in the Eddie Dean uh, series of Westerns for PRC as the Cheyenne Kid. And uh, then he eventually elevated to his own series of films for PRC, starting with uh, 1947's The Law of the Lash. And then he migrated when PRC folded over to... Uh, Ron Orman's uh, Western Adventure films, which King of the Bullwhip is probably the best of the films he made for that outfit, uh, featuring a great uh, battle of whips between uh, Lash and uh, Elizote, the uh, the villain of the piece. And Lash LaRue was so popular, as a matter of fact, that he even spawned an imitator. Uh, Monogram Pictures uh, found uh, an actor by the name of Roland Charles Myers, and cast him in a series of westerns in uh, the late 40s, early 50s as Whit Wilson. And uh, he had uh, a few comic books and such, but he was never as popular as Lash was. Uh, but uh, Lash LaRue was another one of the great western cowboys who, like Hopalong Cassidy, uh, dressed in uh, all black. Uh, by the way, the, uh, when I was saying uh, Buster Crab's real name was Herman Bricks, I was mixing him up with an actor named Bruce Bennett. Bruce Bennett is one of Humphrey Bogart's sidekicks in, uh, not sidekicks, he's he's one of his co-stars in um, the original Sahara about that American tank crew caught up in the middle of the Sahara Desert fighting Nazis. And then uh, three, uh, six years later or five years later, he plays uh, one of the people that joins Humphrey Bogart's group in the treasure of the Sierra Madre. So that was Bruce Bennett. You know, Gino, this has been absolutely wonderful. You are such a window into a not very well-known subgenre of film, particularly American film. And I think we could talk for another hour on the on the beauty and and uh, just uh, uh, endurance of the B Western, and it's endur enduring because of people like you who keep the flame alive. Yeah, because and, and the reason why I do so is because these guys and girls were the original screen superheroes long before Marvel movies came along, DC Comics movies came along and all that stuff. You had guys like Roy Rogers and Hoot Gibson and Ken Maynard and Sunset Carson, you know, who, you know, children, especially young boys, idolized. They wanted to be just like them. As a matter of fact, uh, I use this as my theme song for my program. Uh uh, Whispering Bill Anderson's uh, Right Off in the Sunset, which is a very moving song about uh, Bill Anderson educating his young child about uh, who his heroes were uh, when he was growing up. And I think it's important to keep these heroes alive. And I think that they could still, uh, 
I think that children could still look up to these heroes, you know, flesh and blood heroes, unlike the more unrealistic DC Comics and Marvel movie heroes, you know, because, and, and, and I think these films also instill great moral values, uh, great uh, ethics into kids. And, uh, you know, in keeping with that, I, I always end, uh, you know, my, every episode of Six Gun Theater with uh, uh, my slogan, which is go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all persons, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I always end the program with that. Because I think it's important, you know, that people know to be kind to one another, show love to one another, and 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 act in a just and compassionate way, which is how these a lot of these cowboy heroes did. Um, I think uh, a lot of films nowadays are far too gritty and a little too over the top of the violence. I mean, you know, these films are as actionable as I'd like as I'd prefer. So I I love these old westerns; they're like comfort food to me. And honestly, I just hope that I've been doing a good job of keeping their legacies alive. Because honestly, they're underrepresented on home video. They're underrepresented in the common discussion on film history. I mean, you know, yeah, talking about Casablanca is important. What about that B feature that they showed after Casablanca? There you go. You know, that's just as important. Well, you've been listening and watching Saturday Night at the Movies. I'm your host, Steve Rubin. Our producer is Ben Shrewsbury. We've been listening to a terrific film historian, Gino Cuddy. The name of his show, uh, once again, is Sunset Cuddy Six Gun Theater. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, certainly, if you're in the Connecticut area, you can find it on your local television. Uh, this has been so wonderful, Gino. Thank you for joining us, and I hope to have you back on the show again. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. I really enjoyed this conversation, and thank you for having me on. And if you're inter- if you if you're interested, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Saturday, uh, it's Stephen J. Rubin. Saturday Night at the Movies. It's free. If you like what you hear today, give us a give us a thumbs up. We always appreciate it. And tell your friends about the show. And we appreciate every every time you listen. Thanks, everybody, and good night.